Right, I think that's it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Friday Night Live. I um, hope everyone's well today. I've got quite a few questions. Um, and a lot of the questions, actually, there's, a, there's a quite a big chunk of them all on the same topic. So I've clumped them all together at the beginning. Um, and what they're about, they, they're kind of coming at the same thing from lots of different angles. But it's mainly to do with socialising and drinking and what do you tell your friends and how you go about it and lockdown. So there's quite a few of those. So as I said, I've clumped those all together at the beginning. What I normally do with a question is answer it quite fully and talk around it. But because I'm doing a lot of different questions, um, I might just go through a couple of them quickly on the basis that the fuller answer will come out later on. Um, so I hope that's good for everyone. Um, so the first question is how to tell friends I don't drink. Um, so the obvious way to do it is I don't drink, get that muck out of my face. I don't want it, which probably sounds really facetious, but the fact of the matter is that it's your body and you and you alone decide what goes in it, nobody else. And you don't have to explain yourself to anyone. Um, in the same way, if you don't like a certain type of food, you do not have to sit there in front of people and explain and justify why you don't want it. OK, I'll go on to the, there's a lot more to say on this point anyway, but I'm going to go on to the next question because it because it brings out some of these points anyway. Um, a couple of points. I'm 10 days alcohol free and already planning events where I'm not sat in a pub when lockdown is lifted. So that's good. I'm also happy to have alcohol free drinks as I really dislike soft fizzy drinks. I'm also a health professional, NHS therapist, and I'm struggling with the word sober and the implications this has for me professionally. I'm concerned that my colleagues and some friends would judge me as weak. How can you tell people that you choose not to drink without giving yourself a character assassination? I got by last year by saying it was a 90 day challenge. I did 56 days, but now I know I cannot moderate. So there's a few things there. Um, the 90 day challenge and your 56 days is your in. OK, because if you don't want to go the whole I had a problem all the rest of it. And frankly, that's what not many people want to do that. I certainly didn't. That's what I would say. And that's, in fact, that's pretty much my cover story these days when I'm at work occasions. Um, I say very simply, had children. I found I was very tired a lot from at weekends. I was drinking, but tired. And so I quit alcohol um, and I found I had more energy. I was happier and I just don't want to go back to it anymore. Um, and so that's your in with it. You can say that you stopped for a 90 day challenge and you felt so much better and so much happier. You never wanted to go back to it. You can put a different spin on that story as well. You can say I did a 90 day challenge. Um, I felt so much fitter, so much happier. But also what was a huge surprise to me, I found I enjoyed social occasions, relaxing, all of those things just as much without alcohol. Um, I did go back to it and I just didn't enjoy it anymore. So I've stopped for good. OK, that is, apart from anything else, true for most people, because most people quit drinking because of all the downsides. But the thing that keeps them stopped is the huge benefits of sobriety. So it's not an out and out lie, even if you've got a serious problem with alcohol. You stopped. You gave it a, ch a chance. You really enjoyed being sober. You started again. You didn't like drinking. So you've just quit. Um, I think there's a few other points there that are really worth um, bringing out. So that thing about colleagues and some friends would judge me as weak. Now, again, this is a perception thing um, and it's worth trying to work on your mindset because at the end of the day, something I can't remember is like 87% of people drink. It's between 80 and 90% of people in Western society. So the US, Australia, UK drink alcohol. OK, it's the normal thing to do. Everybody does it. OK, it is addictive and people do get addicted to it. And despite what anyone will tell you, normal drinkers are addicted to it. Now, let me clarify this. There is a difference between being properly physically addicted and being psychologically addicted. OK, lots of people will go, for example, all week without drinking. Absolutely fine. And they go out in the evening on a Friday or Saturday and they have a few drinks. OK, and that's considered normal drinking. But the fact of the matter is those people do not enjoy their social occasions without a drink. OK, they don't enjoy them as much. If they have to be designated driver, they put on a brave face. They go through the evening, but they don't enjoy it as much as if they were drinking. OK, and that has fed in to a myth that's so widely believed it's almost a fact that alcohol adds and makes us enjoy social occasions more. OK, stop and think for a minute about when you were a child. 
okay children enjoy social occasions without alcohol okay they go berserk they have a fantastic time they laugh think about when you were at school with friends before you started drinking we used to do the most ridiculous things I remember laughing so much at school but there was no alcohol involved so what happens is we get to a certain age we start drinking and then we find we can't enjoy social occasions without alcohol so lots of people are addicted to alcohol in that they cannot enjoy a social occasion without a drink or they don't enjoy it as much okay which gives um sort of tongue service to this lie that you know it's it's not so much fun if you're not drinking going out with friends isn't as much fun without unless you're drinking but another way of saying that is I can't enjoy myself properly without a drug which is exactly what it comes down to so that's the psychological addiction okay so all of these people out there are drinking because they have to because they've forgotten how to enjoy themselves without a drink it takes perception and courage to start questioning your relationship with alcohol and to actually do something about it. It's far easier to just keep drinking, to just bury your head in the sand and just keep glugging it down, okay? Weak people don't generally stop drinking. It's the stronger people, it's the perceptive people, it's the people with willpower and imagination who've got the guts to actually sample life without their, what I've referred to before as their snotty little comfort blanket. You know, that thing that children have that completely meaningless, but they've got to hold it close to them. Otherwise they start to get panicky. That's what drinkers are like when they with, with their alcohol. It's just some snotty little comfort blanket that they've got to hold on to all the time okay so it's worth you don't say (laughs) don't say this to your colleagues and friends obviously but this is how you need to start seeing it you can't see yourself as weak because you've stopped drinking it takes courage and it takes imagination to stop drinking 87 percent of people drink i don't know how many of them stop drinking but it's a tiny percentage more and more these days people are questioning it um, but the fact of the matter is it takes courage. So you need to start reevaluating yourself. OK, whether you've quit successfully or you're trying or you're going through endless day ones. The fact of the matter is you've got a lot more courage and imagination than most of the people out there who are just hiding their heads in the sand and carrying on as if nothing is wrong, because that is the easiest option. Um, so I think that that pretty much covers off that. Um, So that, I mean, as I say, that's the best way I've come across it. So you stopped drinking for a challenge. You found that you felt so much better and you went back to it and you just didn't really enjoy it anymore. So you've quit. Um, The next one, again, continuing on the theme, preparing and dealing with the outside world socially as we come out of lockdown. My friends and family already know that I'm now a non-drinker, to which I've had a mixed response, and I know some will be eager to encourage me to drink. Surely you can have just one or two. I'm determined not to drink, but realise that my subconscious under pressure may try to hijack my well-intended intentions. Dealing with defensive and forceful responses when people ask, why would you not want to have a drink ever again? Your first grandchild is due in four weeks. Surely you have a bottle of champagne. Genuine question from a lovely friend. Thank you. So again, and you know, it's, it's interesting. All these questions have come in. One of them to talk about is, of course, lockdown, because if you've quit over the last, particularly in the UK, over the last year now, you probably haven't really done any social occasions and socialising is the big thing. So in a way, lockdown has been a good time to stop because once you crack sitting at home in front of the TV without drinking, (laughs) you've pretty much done it all. Okay, because people aren't going on holiday. I suppose we had Christmas. There's that aspect. Um, But it is going to be quite difficult coming out of lockdown. Um, So some of the points to pick up there is it's easy to when people push drinks on you, There's a lot of reasons they might do that. If we're being very generous, we would say the reason they're doing that is because they are concerned for your welfare and they want you to enjoy yourself. Okay, so that's quite a nice thing, but you need to start seeing that for what it is. Um, That's them being addicted to alcohol, albeit maybe just psychologically, because they are someone who has forgotten how to socialize without alcohol. 
They cannot enjoy social occasions without alcohol, so they can't conceive how you can enjoy a social situation without alcohol. OK, so they wanting you to enjoy yourself are trying to push a drink on you because in their mind, they cannot imagine enjoying a social occasion without alcohol. OK, so start seeing it for what it is. It's people who are themselves incapable of getting through certain situations without a drink, which is why they're trying to push it onto you. A, a few other people will say it's because, you know, people don't like being drunk when other people are sober. There may be an element of that. Personally, that was thinking about why I would push drinks on people. That was never the reason. If I was with friends, I kind of, it's almost like I wanted them to come along with me on the drinking exploits almost. Um, but I think that's something just to bear in mind is that the reason they're pushing it is because they can't imagine these events and, and the birth of a grandchild. So in their mind, they can't possibly imagine celebrating without alcohol. OK, so that's why they're pushing these things on you. Um, what you need to bear in mind when you're going to social occasions, if you have, in fact, I think I might go on to the next question because I think this brings up this quite well. Um, I feel stable and confident in my sobriety almost nine months. So if you're in the UK, again, most of this has probably been through lockdown and where I can readily and automatically dismiss triggers within seconds most of the time, which is brilliant because you've broken the back of it. Um, I do feel it's not fully tested on a social level with the pandemic. Before the lockdowns, I didn't go out that much anymore as I had got to the stage when I preferred drinking alone and having to go out made me feel anxious and needing to drink just to make it out the door. Then I would be the party girl. Now I'm free from alcohol, my confidence is back and anxiety has for the most part gone, but I'm slightly worried that suddenly being thrown back into an array of social situations like summer barbecues, beer gardens, school mum drinks, that my brain is going to remember how things were and I'll be at risk of having to go through all the mental discomfort again of working through triggering situations. I guess I just don't want to be complacent and think I've got this and get blindsided by fab or subconscious planting any destructive ideas. Any thoughts on what to expect and how to prepare? So this, this I think, is, is almost a textbook example of what I was talking about. Stop for nine months, but it's almost entirely been within lockdown. Um, how to prepare for it. Okay, you cannot beat visualizing things. Okay, so if you're going to a barbecue, take 20 minutes, half an hour, even a few days before when you're in bed, just start thinking through what you will do. And it's not so much what you will do. But it's just your mental processes when you're offered a drink that you will say, yes, I'll have a whatever soft drinker is available, or what soft drinks do you have or whatever. Um, in alcohol explained too, I think I talk about um, the tipping point. So that crucial time, because this is another thing to bear in mind if you're looking at social occasions and it can seem hugely intimidating. But the fact of the matter is there's usually one or two key points that you can focus in on. So for me, for social occasions, turning up um, is OK. It's it's that the big thing is usually that first drink. So you get offered a drink and it's like, I will have a lemonade or a water or whatever it is. Um, and then because that's a big moment then, because that's what a lot of us fear, because we kind of think, you know, the whole place will go silent. Everyone will look at us and go, oh, my God, they're not drinking. What's going on? Most of the time, people don't care. It's usually towards the beginning of the social occasion where there's not much conversation or people dredging up any kind of conversation. So you can expect a comment like a soft drink to cause a bit of conversation. But actually, when you get past that point and you get the drink and you sit there or stand there, the conversation moves on as it does. And, you know, even if you're the most important person in the world, the topic of conversation for the next six hours isn't going to be you not drinking. Frankly, it's not that interesting for people. They will move on to other topics of conversation. When people then get other drinks, you won't go through the whole explanation progress uh, process again. You'll just end up getting the same drink and it will probably people won't be particularly bothered. So there's that key point at the beginning. So I would visualize going in and just asking for that drink. But what you need to be bearing in mind, and this is how I always look at it, it's easy again to get sucked into that everyone else is going to be enjoying themselves and I'm not because I'm not drinking. OK, so it's probably worth at this point talking a bit about um, the whole physiology, physiology behind it. So 
endorphins are something that your brain releases that makes you feel really good. It makes you feel happy and relaxed and a bit silly and a bit giggly. Okay. We get endorphins when we eat, when we exercise, when we have sex, and most importantly, when we socialize, which is quite an interesting thing. We actually get a chemical kick when we socialize, which shows you what an important part socializing plays in human development, that we actually get this physiological kick from it. Okay. So the problem is that we are creatures of society. And when we socialize, there's always, always for everyone, an element of nervousness. Okay, some people are extremely extroverted and they just relax very quickly into situations. Other people are really introverted and it takes them ages. They're really shy and it takes them a long, long time to relax. But either way, you get, this is the key point you need to bear in mind, you get an endorphin hit when you are relaxed and socializing. Okay, so if you're extremely extroverted, you'll relax and socialize and get the endorphin rush quite quickly. If you're extremely introverted and shy, it will take you much, much longer to relax and feel relaxed to get that endorphin rush. It will get there eventually. It just takes a lot longer. Okay, alcohol being a sedative will sedate your nerves, which will allow you to get feel relaxed and it will give you the endorphin rush a bit earlier. Okay, that great feeling you have when you're drinking with your friends is not an alcohol high. Okay, it's an endorphin high. It's nothing to do with alcohol. Um, if you sit at home um, in just a quiet room with no TV, no music, no friends, no nothing, and drink what you would normally drink at a party, it's an extremely different experience. Okay, it's completely different. You will feel slightly dulled, slightly confused, and slightly tunnel visioned. Okay, it's not pleasant. Okay, it really is that simple. Um, so that's the thing you need to be thinking about. So when you visualize going to, let's say, a summer barbecue and just ordering a drink, a non-alcoholic drink, have all this in mind that the pleasure is actually entirely false from the alcohol anyway. Um, and I don't know about other people, but so things like barbecues, well, <laughs> I'd end up drinking quite a bit. And then I'd eat and because I'd eaten too much. I couldn't drink anymore. And then I started to get into that really horrible, you know, that anxious feeling you get when the alcohol wears off and you can't really drink anymore because you've eaten too much and you feel a bit uncomfortable. It's actually not very pleasant. We tend to think about the beginning bit when we're having those first few drinks, but we forget about all the rest of it, which isn't, isn't actually very nice anyway. There's always a great pleasure as well in driving home from these things. Um, so there's that. So I, I would say definitely prepare mentally for these things so visualize it before you actually get there that can be hugely powerful um, and just remember alcohol never did make social occasions it just has that weird dynamic and another point here of course and this goes back to talking about these so-called normal drinkers so if you are um so you, you go out you feel slightly nervous you have a drink all the drink does is negate the nerve so you can get that endorphin rush OK, when you go out not drinking, it does feel different because having an endorphin rush and alcohol is a different feeling from just having the endorphins. OK, it's not less enjoyable, but it is different. So you, you're not going to get drunk. You're not going to have that feeling, but you will feel good. So you need to be prepared for that. It is a very different feeling. OK, but the normal drinkers, what happens is so they go out and they have a drink and they relax and then they get their endorphin rush. And, the, and, and this is it, as I, I emphasize that this is normal drinkers. This is people that may only have a few glasses of wine when they're out with friends and then not drink all week. But the problem is then if, for example, their designated driver one week, they go out um, and they're not feeling relaxed and they're not feeling comfortable because actually they know they're not going to enjoy themselves because they want to drink. Um, and they're just kind of putting up with the evening, waiting for the next time they can do it when they're not driving so that they can drink. OK, so the key there is because they are not relaxed, they don't get the endorphin rush. OK, so then it instills even more in their mind that that great feeling you get when you're drinking is actually alcohol when it isn't because they get it when they're drinking, but then they start to not get it when they're not drinking. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about people forgetting how to enjoy themselves unless they're drinking. As children, we enjoyed ourselves socializing phenomenally. OK, but when we start drinking, we lose that ability. Now, you can get it back 
And the key to getting it back is to relax into the social situation anyway um, and don't let alcohol derail you. It may sound difficult to do. And if you're introverted, it might be a bit difficult. But what I would say is just go and relax. If you're really nervous about it, have an exit plan. Okay, so if it's really intimidating, tell yourself you're going to go to the event, okay, and just not drink for that event. You may drink the next time or whatever. Just concentrate on this one event and tell yourself if it becomes really unbearable, you will leave. Okay, they're the only rules. You're not going to drink. And when it's really unbearable, you'll leave. But you have to stay and give it a chance. And what you usually find is, yes, of course, when you go there, you'll be thinking about alcohol. But you need to keep in mind that, you know, I don't need this anymore. I'm going to enjoy myself anyway. When you've been offered the drink and all the chat about why you're not drinking has calmed down a bit and you move on to just talking normally, you will start eventually to start concentrating on the conversation and forget about alcohol for a bit. And when that happens, you will get that endorphin rush. It may take a while. It may take more than one event. If you've only done social occasions drinking for the last 30 years, it may take a few events to get into it. The one way to really brush it on, if you can possibly do it, is take someone with you who isn't drinking, because that always changes the dynamic massively. Because, of course, the other thing, part of getting the endorphin rush socialising is feeling part of a group. If you feel excluded from the group because everyone else is doing something you can't do, i.e. drinking, that can also have an impact. OK, so if you can take someone along with you who isn't drinking, that can be hugely powerful as well. Um so the last question on this is confidence and drinking, um, which I think I pretty much covered off anyway. Um, conf- al- alcohol doesn't give you confidence. All it can do is negate nerves. OK, but in social situations, the nerves eventually dissipate anyway. It really is that simple. It just takes a bit longer. Um The next question, could you talk more about the body repair from stopping alcohol? The book mentions the skin and reversing graying hair. Someone else has mentioned the hair recently, but I can't find anything about this. Also skin. At three months, my skin is awful. Is there anything you know of that can be done to help this process, supplements, etc.? I hope to see you Friday. It's very much part of my routine now and helps so much. That's good. Um, So... I don't know. Um, Three months, I would think the the effects of the alcohol should be gone. Um, And I don't know about skin conditions. I'm really sorry. I don't know. In in terms of um, body repair and aging, what you need to bear in mind is alcohol is really bad for you. Um, It stops you sleeping properly, accelerates your heart rate, puts your body under a huge amount of stress. And and so cortisol is a stress hormone and your body releases loads of it when you drink to counteract the sedating effects of the alcohol. It's a physiological reaction. Everyone has it. Okay, your body is to a degree um, self-healing. Okay, but the more damage you do to it, it you can only repair a certain amount of damage. Okay, time just or in and of itself will take a toll on your body. Um, but when you're drinking, you're putting loads and loads of additional pressure and stress on your body and your body can only self repair so much. So if you're not drinking and living a fairly healthy lifestyle, 10 years may have 10 years worth of aging on you. But if you're putting all this additional stress on yourself and not sleeping and accelerating your heart rate and all this cortisol and stress hormones, flying through your body all the time that 10 years may take 20 years on you um the other big thing is sleep i talk about sleep so much but it's such a massive thing people don't understand sleep okay the experts don't understand sleep people don't understand why sleep is so important to us alcohol demolishes your sleep because when you drink alcohol it's a sedative so for the first few hours after you drink it you're heavily sedated But when the sedative wears off, all the stress hormones that your body has produced to counter the sedating effects of the alcohol, alcohol drops off, but they're still in your system. So you're really worked up and anxious and awake. Um, It's usually about five hours after your last drink, which is why drinkers wake up at three, four, five in the morning and are unable to get back to sleep with their hearts racing. This isn't just problem drinkers. It's everyone who drinks. Okay, and if you speak to people about it, they all go, oh, yeah, I thought it was only me. So this massive problem with alcohol, people just haven't spoken about and accepted. Um, 
but that has a massive impact because one of the most crucial parts of sleep is REM sleep. Okay. So this is where your brain lights up almost as if you're fully conscious, but you can't get into a REM sleep when you're heavily sedated, your body can't get you up there because it's too sedated to light your brain up properly. Um, and then of course, after five hours, when you wake up, you can't sleep at all. That impact on sleep has a huge impact impact not only on your mental health but your physical well-being there, there's been studies to show that people who don't sleep properly are more likely to get cancer and all sorts of illnesses and what that really demonstrates is sleep is when your body heals and in destroying sleep apart from all the other things it does alcohol destroys your sleep so your body can't heal itself okay so it in respect of skin, the other massive thing it has is because it tastes so utterly disgusting. We mix loads of refined sugar with it. So people who drink a lot are constantly consuming huge amounts of this refined sugar. It's in beer, it's in wine, it's in everything, all the mixes you put in spirits. So all these alcoholic drinks to cover the foul taste of the alcohol, you have to put loads of refined sugar in it, which is why there's a big correlation between drinking and diabetes. Okay, because all this refined sh sugar that people are drinking to get the alcohol in their system sends their insulin levels all over the place and in the end the brain just gives up because it can't work out what's going on with the blood sugar levels which is what diabetes essentially is um and obviously all that sugar has a massive impact on your skin um so what i would say is i don't know anything about skin three months yes it should be better you might want to go and see is it a dermatologist someone who deals with skin conditions i think it might be um, and see what they say. Um, a few people give up alcohol, of course, and then start consuming loads of chocolate and other refined sugar. So that certainly could be something. If you're doing that, I would certainly try and address that. Um, the next question is, hi, I'm interested to know when CDT levels in blood return to normal after stopping alcohol. Um, so CDT is carbohydrate deficient transferrin. Um, transferrin is a protein that's made by the liver. I'm reading this, by the way, <laughs> I've got a clue about this. I looked it all up on Google, so I'm reading it verbatim to you. Um, <laughs> transferrin is a protein largely named in the liver that regulates an individual's iron absorption into the blood. Um, blah, blah, blah. An individual who drinks too much alcohol increases certain types of transferrin that are carbohydrate deficient. Okay, so when you drink a lot of alcohol, you get large amounts of um carbohydrate deficient transferrin when the cdt level increases it can be measured in the bloodstream and is a biomarker of alcohol abuse okay people who do not drink or drink mod moderately will have lower cdt levels but people who drink four or more drinks a day at least five days a week for two weeks prior to the test will have cdt at significant greater levels so essentially it's something produced by the body that you get only when you drink too much alcohol um, and it says here cdt levels return to normal within four weeks okay so it's something that spikes in your blood and it remains there for four weeks so if you're a very heavy drinker um, and you quit drinking for a week, people will still be able to tell that you were drinking heavily because it remains for four weeks. But the answer to the question is, um, according to the Google search I did, four weeks. Um, just one question. I'm on day four of being alcohol-free, but I'm having dreams where I cave and have a pint. I'm not struggling at all when I'm awake. Um, is is this just my subconscious brain trying to hijack me? I, a lot of people post about dreams and it seems to upset people a lot. So I dream I'm drinking three or four times a month. I do it all the time. In fact, it's got to a reoccurring dream where I'm always going back to this same pub that I've never been to. It doesn't exist in any, I don't know, my brain's just invented <laughs> this pub that I go to to drink in. Um, it's always really bizarre. But what I would say is, for me, anyway, I'm always really glad when I wake up because I wake up and think, oh, thank God, what horrible dream. I thought I was drinking again. Um, and that's the key. We don't know anything about dreams. It goes back to what I was saying about before. Even the experts don't understand dreams. You have all these, you know, ridiculous things about trying to interpret dreams. The fact of the matter is nobody knows what dreams mean. They're certainly not reality. OK, so don't worry about it. I just always think if you're waking up and thinking, oh my God, I thought I was drinking again. Thank God I'm not. That's a good sign and don't worry about it. Um, so I, I know people post about this all the time, but for me, I dream I'm drinking lots. I always wake up and it's a massive relief that I'm not drinking. Um, and 
I don't worry about it, to be honest. Um, the next one's an interesting one. Questions would be to explore further how it affects children. So when I first quit, I kind of had in mind, <laughs> just as a side benefit, that it might make me enjoy parenthood a bit more because the two things I say that you need when you're a parent is energy and patience. Um, and the two things that alcohol rob you of so much, not just because of its effect on sleep, but alcohol puts your heart rate up. And again, it does this for everyone, not just chronic problem drinkers or those that are physically dependent, everybody, even the so-called normal drinkers, it puts their heart rate up. So it robs you of sleep and puts your heart rate up. Now, one of the things when your heart rate goes up, you want to sit down and rest. It's your body's fail safe mechanism to stop you straining, you know, overdoing things. So the faster your heart goes, the more you just want to stop and sit down. OK, if you're artificially elevating your heart by taking a chemical, then you're constantly more exhausted and lethargic and tired than you'd otherwise be. Add on the sleep deprivation and you're constantly lacking in energy and tired. And what makes you bad tempered? Being tired. So for me, stopping drinking, I hoped would make me a better parent by giving me more energy um, and making me a bit less impatient which it absolutely has done to such an extent I've got absolutely no doubt it's transferred fatherhood for me for being something that I just didn't like and wanted nothing to do with deeply regretted having children almost as soon as we had them to actually enjoying it um, so there's that aspect and that was kind of the thing I focused on and looked at the positives of um, and probably shows how <laughs> insular I am but it wasn't until a long time afterwards that I started to and in fact reading I think it was Jason Vale's book um, started to think look at it from the other side and think actually yeah it would have affected them as well um, not just because and, and, and let's get away from you know obviously if you've got someone who's severely alcohol dependent you know their emotions are all over the place they're falling asleep or falling unconscious left right and center they can't be a good parent and the children obviously are going to suffer but I think even just having a bit more patience and not losing your temper so easily because the other thing of course with um bad temper and anger and this is something I kind of it took me a few years to really appreciate if you're in a bad mood other people get in a bad mood as well particularly during lockdown I mean you're all stuck in the house together if you've got one person walking around with a face like a smacked bottom looking really miserable and grumpy it kind of puts everyone else in a bad mood and if one person loses their temper and starts throwing their toys out the pram and screaming and shouting everyone starts losing their temper but if you're walking around fairly positive and happy all the time, that's what other people do as well. I really genuinely believe that emotions are like we're broadcasting them when we're walking around. Um, and that's why when people say, you know, I don't I can't get through parenthood or, you know, it's so important to me to have a drink. And I'm on the school WhatsApp groups. And when this most recent lockdown was announced, it was mid January and everyone was like, oh, I'm not going through dry January then. I was thinking, how, why? You're, you're, you, how can you? go through this drinking being tired and cranky all day long it's ridiculous so I think the children have a completely different parent because having someone that isn't tired um, and isn't grumpy just makes for a happy atmosphere in the house and not to say it's always a happy atmosphere of course it isn't with children there's always rows and tantrums and all the rest of it and that's just from me um, but the fact of the matter is generally you're having a better time of it so for me parenthood isn't about being good or bad it's just about doing the best you can and you can't be doing the best you can if you're tired um, and if you're slightly bad tempered and you've got no energy okay and I don't care what anyone says about that um, but of course the other point there is is coping mechanisms because children do learn from the adults around them whether they like it or not and if they see parents who are having a drink every night they get in from work or having a drink even every time they socialize that's what they're going to learn and they're going to go to social occasions when they're 14 15 16 17 whatever and they're going to copy what they saw other people doing which is having a drink um so i'm hoping as well by not drinking i'm providing them with slightly better coping mechanisms or showing them, you know, I always say this, they may grow up and they may drink loads and they may do all sorts of things, but at least I will know that it's not because 
their father figure was drinking all the time and that's what they've grown up to learn from. Um, I'm on day 70 and was originally aiming for 100 days, but would like to keep going. At the moment, all is fine and I'm not entertaining the idea of drinking because 100 days is my in my head, so no cravings. I'm worried that when I get to 100 days that the cravings will come back and I'll struggle. Any tips for how I can refocus away from 100 days to longer term thinking? Thank you. So that's a really interesting one. Um, it is true what you say. If you've got a time period in mind, it can stop the cravings because as I've dealt with many times. Cravings is about you largely it's about fantasizing about having a drink and then entertaining the possibility of having one so you start really torturing yourself because it's almost within reach so if you're just content that you're not going to drink for this set period you almost you, you can negate the whole craving process because you don't start fantasizing about it and entertaining the possibility of having it um, so there's a few things you can do you can just keep extending the days indefinitely um, but what i would say is at some point and if that's working for you keep doing it but at some point you might want to start thinking stop doing the 100 days 150 days whatever and just say I'm going to keep going with this well, an interesting way of doing it when we're not drinking we often fantasize about drinking about how nice it will be but start thinking about the reality of it okay start thinking about waking up tired lethargic start thinking about having that first drink that will make you feel slightly dull because don't forget a big part of the pleasure for regular drinkers is relieving the anxiety and the extra stress hormones and the cortisol that's been left over from the last drinking that's leaving you feeling anxious you also feel tired alcohol being a sedative will negate that feeling of tiredness Okay, so a lot of it is just relieving the symptoms it's caused previously. When you go back to drinking, having stopped for a while, it's not that pleasant. Okay, so I would start focusing on, okay, this is my life now. I'm well rested. Um, I'm feeling better. I sleep well. All of the benefits um, and start thinking about how you would feel if you were drinking. Okay, so don't just think about how nice it would be to sit back and have a nice cold beer. Um, think about waking up in the middle of the night, being unable to sleep, thinking about the, um, the anxious feeling when one drink wears off and needing another one. Think of just the reality of all of it and start comparing the two lives. Um, and you might want to, you might start to find like a lot of us find is that the thought of going back is just repulsive. It's just not something you ever want to do. It's something you've very much moved on from. So you could start looking at it that way. Um, as I say, so that's what I would do. You either just keep extending the days or at some point you accept that I'm just not doing this again. Um, and the way to do that is to just to, to, to realize that you're not actually giving anything up at all anyway. Um, the whole thing's almost like an elaborate con that people have taught themselves into. Um, the next question. Hi, William. You talk about after having one drink, your body expects the onslaught of loads more and releases natural stimulants to counteract the depressive effects of alcohol, making us feel edgy and anxious. So I'm guessing when even thinking about having a drink, your body releases stimulants. And that's why we feel edgy. Is this correct and covered in any of your books? Um, I haven't read Alcohol Explained 2 yet. So it's partly correct is it in one of the books i don't know it was definitely on a blog post i did um but the fact of the matter is um what you're saying there is partly right and partly wrong when you say when even thinking about having a drink your body releases stimulants not necessarily because thinking abstractly about it your body's not going to release stimulants but um the fact is that if the human mind has imagination um, and the body reacts the same to a vividly imagined event as to um, something that's real. OK, so, for example, if you're sat watching a film and as a horror film and there's a, you know, a jump out of your skin moment, your heart rate increases. OK, because for that moment you're in the film and your body's reacting as if you're actually there. Um, so it's not just thinking about having a drink. You really need to be craving it and thinking about it and, you know, almost about to take it. So you, your brain has to be really anticipating having it. Um, so I think that's what, you, and as I say, it was on, I did do a post of it on the website. I think I can't remember what the name of it was. 
Um, hi, William. What are your thoughts on not engaging in old hobbies, interests that bring up associations with drinking, taking up new hobbies and interests that are not so compatible with drinking and hangovers, basically ditching things like computer games, in my case, in favour of activities such as running, which if one were to drink during or beforehand would directly and negatively impact progress in that chosen activity. So this is a very interesting one. I, this is, the, let's go back to the drinking and socializing dynamic. Okay. We drink and we, so don't, we, when we're born, we don't drink. Okay. So when we're younger, we socialize and we enjoy it without alcohol. When we introduce alcohol, we very soon, become a sort of obsessed with it and we then start to believe we can't enjoy ourselves without it so we don't enjoy ourselves without it so we forget how to socialize with alcohol so it's very easy then to say okay well I'm all right most of the time but I so struggle with socializing so I just won't socialize and then like we've done in the pandemic there hasn't really been any socializing so it's made it a lot easier but to my mind, that's not really um, digging the problem out and dealing with it, because ideally what we would do is go back to actually learning to socialize without alcohol and enjoying it without alcohol. That's really what we need to be doing. So what I would say to that question is I would divide these hobbies and interests into two things. OK, things that are inherently enjoyable without the alcohol and things that aren't. OK, so, for example, um, I don't know really, but let's say you, I don't know, did a book club. Well, let's take socializing as a classic one. You might say to yourself, um, I really associate that with drinking, so I'm not going to do it. But actually, if you learn to do it without drinking, that's the ideal solution. It doesn't just impact things we do when we're drinking, because it's funny you shouldn't mention computer games. But when you wake up with a hangover and you've not slept properly and your heart rate's elevated, you feel lethargic, but you also can't sleep because all those um, stimulants and your brain's recalibrated to act under the sedating effects of the alcohol. So you're kind of really awake and a bit edgy. Actually, a computer game's perfect because you don't have to do anything physically, but it's enough to occupy your mind mentally. So in a way, it's a great thing to do. So I personally found I used to play a lot of computer games. And since stopping drinking, I do still play them occasionally, but I can't sit there for hours and hours on end like I used to. And I think that's a direct impact of the fact that I've got a bit more in energy and I just don't like sitting around for that amount of time. So what I would say is I would try and divide them between things that are inherently enjoyable anyway and things that aren't. So, for example, you might go to the pub and just drink, but if you take the alcohol out of the, of, of the equation, why would you be doing that? It's a bit of a pointless thing to do. But also, if you're going there to eat and see friends and you want to do it anyway. So what I would say is try to work out what you do that is inherently enjoyable and keep doing it but the things you were only doing because there was alcohol involved, stop doing it, um, which I think is probably the best way of going about that. Um, how, could we discuss how to keep momentum going when there is so much out there in terms of bias towards alcohol and keeping the mind sharp on what the actual reality of drinking alcohol does to us in mind and body? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose that partly um, being involved with groups like this, um, keep reading, quit, let all that kind of thing is one of the things you can do for that. Um, I think eventually, if you keep working on that, it does become a complete mind shift. OK, so I don't feel like I have to work towards seeing the reality of drinking anymore. I just see it for what it is. Um, and I see all the build up. I see, you know, the so-called normal drinkers saying, oh, it's, you can't have a night out. You know, it's not much fun going out and not drinking as the rubbish that it is. Um, so I think, it, it's, I think Alan Carr said in his book about smoking, it's like an illusion. And when you see the illusion, you see the reality, you can't unsee it. Um, and that's kind of how I, how I feel with drinking. Um, so I think you just keep going with it. You keep countering the triggers. You keep forcing yourself to see it as it really is. And eventually that just becomes your new norm. Um, hi, William. I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts about what some in recovery circles refer to as the pink cloud and whether or not you agree if you believe such a thing exists. 
that there might be a danger of relapsing after it passes. I, I do believe in it, and I do believe there's a danger of relapsing after it passes, but I don't think it's what most people think it is. Because, so when we drink alcohol, we're tired, we're anxious, we're lethargic, um, we feel miserable, everything becomes a problem. Because one of the other things that the alcohol, the chemical imbalance causes when we're drinking is that we feel less mentally resilient. So little problems derail us where they don't when we're not drinking. Okay, so when we quit, we sleep better, we feel more confident, more stronger, we feel more energetic, everything's better. And we suddenly think, what on earth was I doing? This is life. This is fantastic. Okay. And that's the pink cloud. It's coming out of that really dark, unpleasant phase where you're constantly half tired, you know, slightly anxious. Everything's an effort. Things derail you and upset you really easily to just getting back to normal and feeling really good about it. Okay. That's what the pink cloud is. It's the secret of sobriety, if you like. But the problem is for humans, that soon becomes our norm. So we're used to waking up feeling good. We're used to getting a good night's sleep. We're used to feeling a bit fitter, a bit more energetic. We're used to feeling a bit more resilient and being able to deal with things quite easily. Um, and it becomes normal. Okay. So because it becomes normal, so, so your mindset is this is fantastic, but as it's happening all the time, all the time, all the time, it just becomes your new norm. But the problem is because of the effects of things like fading effect bias, we're still fantasizing about drinking. So we still tend to think of those happy times we had a drink and wasn't it fun and all the rest of it, all the, we're still buying into the nonsense, if you like. Um, so I think it does, it does cause a danger of relapse, but only if you start taking it for granted. And that's what I often say. And I suppose in a way it, it goes back to the previous question about how do we keep momentum? It's, it's to not take things for granted because we're very good at that as humans. You know, your massively improved physical and mental state soon becomes the norm and you start to forget how awful it was when you were drinking. So don't take it for granted. Um, and in that way, the pink cloud just <laughs> keeps going forever. Um, it really is that simple. Just don't, just don't stop taking it for granted. You know, it just, it just every so often when you wake up, imagine how you would have felt if you'd woken up when you'd be drinking and forget hangover, you know, think about the so-called normal drinker with their one or two glasses of wine. They're still going to be waking up at four in the morning, unable to sleep and tired and feeling slightly anxious the next day. These people, we have this inherent belief with drugs, particularly alcohol, that there's good and bad to it. And if you can just cut down a little bit, you can have the good without the bad. You need to get this straight in your mind. The good and the bad are inextricably linked with alcohol. And the good is not what you think it is anyway. Okay. Even if you could have one or two once or twice a week, it would still wear off leaving you feeling anxious and unpleasant. It will still wake you up at three or four in the morning. It will still elevate your heart rate and make you feel tired and wanting to sit down. All of those things, people who drink less, the reason it's not that they get less of the bad. What it normally means is they just enjoy it less. If you enjoy something, why would you only want one or two of them once or twice a week? If I enjoy something, I want as much of it as I can possibly get. So the reason they're drinking less is just they haven't become fully addicted to it yet to think that they actually enjoy it, but they're mugs because they're still getting the downside of it. Ridiculous. Um, sorry, but <laughs> of a rant there. Um, I was a binge drinker, no off switch. I've been totally fine during my six months alcohol free. The last couple of weeks, I've really craved a drink, even though I know the consequences. So probably talked around that a bit. The no off switch thing, I just want to mention that because we are all born with an off switch. Okay. When you have a drink, it doesn't taste very nice and it makes you feel a bit funny and your brain says, this is not right. Stop doing it. But as you keep going and keep going and keep going with it, your brain starts to learn a very important lesson. And that's that when you have a drink and it starts to wear off, it leaves an unpleasant feeling that has. And when you take another drink, that other drink rel relieves that feeling. Okay, so we start off with the brain saying, this isn't good, don't do it. So when you have a drink, you don't want another one. But over the years, you learn a new lesson. That actually, when one drink wears off, it leaves an unpleasant feeling caused by that chemical imbalance that needs another drink to relieve it. Okay, 
and that that is learned behavior but when you learn it that's when you lose your off switch because every alcoholic drink as it wears off it causes a desire for the next one okay so everyone is born with an off switch but we can learn through repetition through drinking to get rid of it and when it's lost it can never be regained because it is learned behavior um so what i would say is um just bear that in mind but you really crave to drink, even though I know the consequences. Okay, forget the consequences. Everyone knows the consequences. It's not the consequences that drag us into the drink. It's the idea of it being pleasurable. Okay, so stop concentrating on the consequences and stop drinking, stop, start concentrating on the so-called positives, the thing that's drawing you in, because it's rubbish. Okay, it's a fantasy. That's what these beliefs are. It's a nonsense. We tend to fantasize about it and to start thinking about, you know, we'll have a drink and it will be really funny and I'll have a really nice time and all the rest of it. But you won't. I absolutely guarantee you won't. There's lots of reasons for that. But one of the big ones is when you start to recognize you have a problem with alcohol, when you want to stop, when you drink again, you stop enjoying it because part of you is worrying about the fact that as soon as that drink takes, passes your lips, you'll start to feel guilty and you'll start to feel worried. You're particularly worried about the following day um, and that will poison the whole evening. So you won't even enjoy the evening. Don't forget as well what we're dealing with here. It is a drug. OK, it's a sedative. OK, so it just dulls your nerves slightly, decreases nerve activity. So when you drink it, you will feel slightly dulled. OK, a bit tunnel visioned and a bit confused when it wears off because your brain has recalibrated to work under the sedating effects of the alcohol. When the alcohol wears off, you're left feeling slightly overly anxious um, and you will then want another drink to relieve that anxiety. And that's what we're dealing with here. OK, it's a drug that people happen to get into their bloodstream by drinking it instead of injecting it or smoking it or snorting it. And it will make you feel slightly dulled before leaving a corresponding feeling of anxiety that needs another drink to relieve it. So forget the consequences. Start looking at the so-called positives, but look at it realistically and in reality. Um, God, I've still got a load more questions to go. <laughs> in quite a long time now. Um, I'll try and rattle through the... Um, last few to get through them what's your opinion of big alcohol and their slogan drink responsibly or the government's use of the words drugs and alcohol implying alcohol is not a drug do you think these phrases are misleading of the general public um so the drink responsibly is obviously ridiculous because it's addictive so going back to what i said when when you when you don't when you lose the off switch which most people do at some point through repetition um, and everyone will get there eventually drinking responsibly isn't an option because when every drink wears off it creates a need for the next one you know you wouldn't advise people to inject heroin responsibly or smoke, even smoke cigarettes responsibly because they're addictive um, and that I think just goes to show the massive mindset society needs to to get to in respect of alcohol drugs and alcohol I use that myself, but I've kind of been sucked into it because I think of drugs as narcotics. So actually legal drugs, whereas alcohol is a legal drug. But I suppose really, yeah, you, you, we, we should specify by saying illegal drugs and alcohol, which is a legal drug. I suppose it is misleading in a way. Um, I don't know that it's done deliberately anyway. I think it's just language and people using words in certain, so, certain situations. <clears throat> if you have time, a personal situation question. I'm six weeks without alcohol now, but have some mornings I'm waking up with hangover type symptoms. I'm assuming it's related to the painkillers I'm taking for my shoulder, aspirin, paracetamol, and sometimes tramadol, a CNS depressant like alcohol is. Is this a normal brain reaction in trying to counter the depressant effects or has my brain become oversensitive to these types of drugs because of the two decades of daily drinking? If so, might it right itself in time or once the brain has been rewired through addiction will I always have more of a withdrawal reaction to depressant medication going forward not technically your area but it's all the same drug group thanks for all the time you put into the group so yeah it's not my area and I don't really know I've not heard of tramadol what I would say is though a lot of these things do cause withdrawal that that slight disruption to brain chemistry that hangs around when the drug wears off um, I don't necessarily think it's because you've become hyper um, sort of um, reactive to depressant medication 
what it can often be is just you're alive to it. It's, it's, I think it's what people call mindfulness. It's just being aware of what's happening with your body. People drink, people have drank for thousands of years and never thought of it in terms of withdrawal. It's extraordinary. Um, and yet that's exactly what it is. Um, so when you start to become aware of these things, you will become aware of it, not just with alcohol, but with other things you do. So I cannot personally say what's going on inside you with tramadol, but I don't think it's necessarily because previous heavy drinking has caused you to be more reactive to these things. It might just be that now you're aware of the chemistry as drugs wear off, that you're focused in on it and thinking about it. Um, I don't know about the whole thing about waking up with hangover type symptoms, but it sounds like it could be related to the painkillers if you weren't having them prior to that. Um, the next question, my question subject for discussion is this. Can you comment on non-sober behavior even though someone is not drinking? I heard this reference when listening to a podcast. Mayim Bailick's breakdown featuring Leslie Jordan. He said he'd be, he had become sober but still observed himself exhibiting non-sober behavior that he then had to address on his journey. I'm really curious about this because a large part of the getting sober journey is the addressing behaviors and coping mechanisms after I've stopped drinking, but I don't hear, see as much emphasis on that part of the work. I, I, I don't know because I've not seen this podcast, but usually what people are talking about, there's a thing in AA where you don't just stop drinking. You have to kind of cure some character defects. Um, and one of them is to stop being like so selfish. And I think they describe it in the big book as like, a stage with all these actors on it and things don't always go your way so you shouldn't get really het up when things don't work out for you and just be a bit more peaceful and a bit calmer about things um i always had a bit of an issue with that to be honest it was one of the things i didn't like about aa because i am a solicitor so one of the things i have to do is argue <laughs> with people um and being able to do that successfully is part of being good at your job so someone saying yeah but to stop drinking you have to just go with the flow and relax and not argue with people felt very wrong to me um also i remember sitting in an aa meeting once when someone was saying about how their friend had stolen a load of money from them and they weren't they were trying not to get annoyed about it because it was going you know they were trying to keep kind of thinking god i would be that would really irritate me i'd be saying something about that jesus um so it all sounded a bit weird to me so I personally would say if you're looking at self-improvement and I say this a few times, it's like a Russian doll. Okay. You open it and there's things inside it. Okay. So for some people, drugs <laughs> and illegal drugs and legal drugs like alcohol are always the outer layer. Okay. When you open it, a lot of people find there's nothing inside. That's it. That's them done. Alcohol was all of their problems. It caused the sleeplessness, the anxiety, the tiredness. And with that gone, their lives are not perfect, but fine. Okay, some people open it up and they've got compulsive behavior and they open that up and there's some kind of childhood trauma, um, all of these things. If you're looking at self-improvement, the first thing you do is deal with the alcohol or the illegal drugs. Um, and then the second thing you might want to look at is your own character defects. Um, AA have tied the two together, so it's inextricably linked, but I personally don't think you need to. I think if you stop drinking and you're fairly happy with who you are, um, then um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. But that's usually what they're talking about. It's people who quit drinking and it's still kind of like selfish and petty and get angry about things and all the rest of it, like most normal human beings do, particularly me. Um, if you take the alcohol out of a fruit cake, you still have a fruit cake. Q, some people fall apart without a coping mechanism, even if it's doing them harm. I cause more problems sober, even though I don't like the consequences of drinking. Thoughts, please. My thoughts are that I would like a bit more information on that because I'm struggling to imagine how anybody on the planet can cause more problems sober. Because when you're drunk, your, your um, emotions are all out of whack. You're argumentative. You're introspective. You're an unpleasant person. No matter how bad you are sober, you're always worse drunk. Um, so I, I can't really answer that. I would need a lot more examples. Um, but I'd be absolutely shocked if anyone can be more problematic sober than they are drinking. Um, my problem is fading effect bias and the desire to celebrate with booze. 
Um, not a real problem to stop drinking outside of celebration and holidays. Can Thursday be considered as a celebration in this COVID world? So this is another thing. Um, celebrating is when we're happy about something. OK, so we're naturally pleased and happy and buoyant. Why would you why would you take a sedative? <laughs> how how is that in any way rational? I'm happy and enjoying myself. So I'm going to take a drug to dampen my feelings down is, is ridiculous. And again, just goes back to how normalized it is that everything has to be done with a with a drink. And what happens is something good happens. The reality is, is not that alcohol adds to celebrations but something's wonderful has happened but you know what I can't enjoy it because I haven't got my snotty little comfort blanket with me I'm this wonderful thing has happened in my life for example I've got a new grandchild but I'm so pathetic I can't enjoy it without my alcohol okay so when you have the alcohol all that does is to allow you to celebrate and actually enjoy the occasion. So that's the fact of the matter with people, all these so-called normal drinkers who want alcohol to celebrate, that's where they are. They just can't enjoy it without it. But just focus in on that. It's a sedative. How on earth can it make you enjoy anything more when all it's doing is slightly depressing or sedating your feelings? Um, blimey, that was an hour. That was over an hour. Um, <laughs> I wonder if anyone's been left, <laughs> everyone's gone to bed by now. I hope that was all right for everyone. Um, I will be back next week if there's enough interest. I'll do a post in the group on Thursday um, and see what the response is. I haven't actually got a guest lined up, so I'll either try and find someone. I think the overwhelming response was one week guests, one week me. Um, and yeah, either way, I will hopefully see you next week. Good night. <laughs>